Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 22nd. Today's topic is they've been reading closely, now what? Our special guest is Valerie Burton. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffitt, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Tony Plourd, who's going to introduce Valerie for us and ask the newbie question. Hi there. I'm so excited to welcome Valerie to, uh, to our show. She is from uh, West Jefferson High School in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, she has um, taught, is teaching advanced placement literature and the English 2 classes, as well as she's the department head. She was named Distinguished Digital Educator by Jefferson Parish School System in 2014, and she has a philosophy of using inquiry-based um, education. She likes project-based learning and technology to make the the um, classroom learning very enjoyable for her students. She's got a lot of, she realizes that they have a lot of strengths and weaknesses and learning styles. And so her success in life now has been to help them succeed um, by having a diversified classroom. And I, I have met Valerie at uh, uh, Discovery Education Network's um, Summer Institute back in 2012. She has a wonderful, marvelous sense of humor, and we are so excited to, um, to welcome her. She describes herself as a tech junkie who often tweets and blogs and creates wiki pages daily. So here to this busy teacher, thank you for coming, Valerie. Good morning, all. Thank you, Tony, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, we have a newbie question for this Saturday. And it's, what's the difference between formative and summative assessment? I think assessment is one of the buzzwords of the last couple of years. And it's a scary thing for us because for some of us, it seems as though our paychecks, our jobs, our futures rest on the results of assessments and test scores. Um, so to make sure that our newbies understand the difference, formative assessment helps us figure out how much of our lesson our kids actually understand. It allows us to be able to change up our lesson plans to see what they might be lacking or what they might be getting within the class so we can adjust our lessons accordingly. So it's like that one big final piece where we can really see just how well they shine. It's the, the end of the unit. How much of my lectures did you really can, how much can you show me that you've gotten what I tried to give to you? So the formative assessments are the small little bitty pieces that help us design lessons that drive student learning. And the summative assessments are those huger chunks where we can actually see whether or not the kids have actually gotten it. Going in and out. All right, I'll try to talk slowly or adjust my mic. All right, so I am proud of all of the work my students are doing. I want to make sure that I highlight their essays, um, the drawings that they do, the pictures that they take. This is an example of what I call word art, and I have the kids create some sort of visual based on one of the stories that we've read. This one was the proud. It was done in response to we read an excerpt from Joy Luck Club, and the Joy Luck Club 
be one of the main ideas has to do with having family pride and pride within yourself and your culture. So this student drew the word proud with a trophy and a crown and a chessboard for those of you who are familiar with the story. So this is a way I was able to assess whether or not she got some of the main components of the story without her having to answer questions or bubble in an answer. Has my audio got any better or is it still fading in and out? All right, I really think it's important that our scholars curate and create. They have the freedom and the talent to examine, analyze, synthesize, manipulate, mash up, rework. And we need to allow them the opportunities to do that. Not only do they need to bubble in and write essays, they need to be able to publish their work, to produce, to create, to discuss. And I want to talk about some of the ways that they can do that today. The things that I've used in my class. My kids create memes, they create videos, they do word art like the one you saw before. They create poems based on text. We do six word memoirs, four by four responses, and they have e-portfolios where they can create all of the good work that they do. So for me, um, close reading, I think, has been one of those um, things that puts the, the fear into a lot of people. How do I get them to do that? And then once they've done it, how do I get them to show me? We show them how to use notebook templates. We give them annotation guides. We give them rereading opinion years and vocabulary lessons to make sure that they can tackle the text. The next thing we need to do is to provide them the opportunities to show us. So memes. I don't know if any of you have used memes in the classroom, but that's like one of the things I started using last year, and the kids really love it. Memes allow the kids to select an image and to overlay it with some based text or text that gives a slice of life message to um, show that they understand what's going on in the text. And whether that text has to do with a story that we've read or an article or if it's in a math class, concepts that you're going over or a science, the experiments you're doing. Try having your kids create a meme in response to that. We use a meme generator in class, and um, a lot of them are blocked, but the one we use, the kids have the opportunity to select from a series of images, put the text in from the top and the bottom, change the font, change whether or not they want it highlighted, all caps, and yeah, they have an opportunity to really demonstrate what they know because just like someone in the audience in the uh, chat room said, you can't parody something you don't understand. All right, so it is a great way to be able to check that they understand what's going on. This week, um, we read, um, we didn't read, we watched 2081 and is a movie version of Harrison Bergeron where all intelligent people are handicapped. All um, artists are given handicaps. So these are some of the memes that my kids came up with. And it gave me an opportunity to see that they understand, they understood what was going on, the messages behind the story, the absurdity, and and, and the idea of, I'm going to make everyone equal by taking away those people who are extraordinary. So if you haven't tried having your kids make memes, do that. Any of them have an app on their phone, or you can get, it, um, you can get something from online. 
So for the math class, they can create a meme to demonstrate the importance of measurement or computation for students, something that highlights the importance of scientific discoveries. Social studies, they can analyze different speeches or points of view. Foreign language, they can create memes about words they have to study. So there are a lot of variety of um, things that they can do if you allow them to create memes. Another way to check for understanding, and this would be a quick way to check, uh, this would be one of those formative things. Have them create a 20 or 25 word summary, a gist statement about the text. A lot of times when we think of summaries, we think of it as a lower level skill. But if you tell them they have to do it in 20 words or 25 words, that steps up the critical thinking. It means that they now have to manipulate the language to come up with words to summarize whatever the text is in 20 or 25 words. The next thing is, um, I have a slide here about hashtagging. The kids always talk in hashtags. They tweet hashtags, Instagram hashtags. So why not have them hashtag a unit or um, a story or have them quickly create a bulletin board for you on one of the lessons that you've just finished or one of the lessons that you want to do. Grab a couple of kids. Have them create some hashtags to introduce your, your next upcoming lesson. So the gist statements and the hashtags, again, quick ways to quickly assess that they're into going on. And the gist statements, um, for those of you who've never done it, it's really funny to see the wheels turning. All right, as they try to come up with 20 or 25 words to summarize a chapter. Give them some um, directions. So this is a direction slide. Uh, we read um, Ballad of Birmingham last year. And the first thing I had them to do was to identify the who, what, when, where, hows. Then I had them to write a 25 word just statement and to come up with a couple of hashtags. All right, so that's just add up on the board for them. So after they finished the poem, they did this, and then we went into a discussion about the poem. The next thing I want to talk about is the use of images. Um, using images or having them to create images a way to make sure that you tap in on all of your kids, those who are the visual learners, as well as the tactile. The, the visuals help them see a lot of times the text in a different way. Um, and you can really see that too when they're doing the memes because they have to visually connect something with the text to the me. So wordles, most of us are familiar with the word clouds. Have them create a wordle. All right, have them explain, express. And for me, I don't have them just paste the words into wordles. I have them to put in, make the larger words, the most important things larger, you know, so that it's a conscious effort, the different sizes of the words. Have them um, explain it, whether they're explaining it orally as they show their word to the class, or whether they write uh, an essay, or they, they post their word to their blog and explain why certain terms are larger than others. So for this student, obviously I don't know if anyone's familiar with this story, 
blessed me on chemo, but obviously at one with nature was one of the most important concepts that they saw. All right, more so than family traditions. And, and you can easily get, you know, as you look at their representation and listen to why they give you the rationale behind their decisions, you can tell whether or not they got it or not. I also like to have my kids their own work. Okay, so again, this one was done in response to Joy Luck Club. Um, this is Evan, and Evan did this in response to our reading of Macbeth. So he took a word, and that word art is you take a word and you decorate from that word. So he chose the word supernatural. And within the word supernatural, he then incorporate some supernatural items. Not all of your kids are going to be artists because Evan is actually, he, he's gifted and talented. Not everyone's going to be gifted and talented. All right. This basically is a series of balloon letters that are decorated. So you don't really have to be a true artist. So this is, um, this is a, an example of some of the directions you can give them if you want them to do this for class or social studies. I told them we're creating this word art in response to, so one of them was Macbeth, one was Joy Luck Club. Identify a word or two to three words at the most. It can be one word or a phrase. That's important to the text and use it as a basis. You'll need to decoratively write your word and include symbols that are representative of the text. And they were then told to post this to their blog and explain. So again, it gives me the opportunity to check and see how much it is that they did take away from the text we read. Paper posters. Students have been making paper posters for years. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right. I loved this example. Um, she took some of the dialogue and incorporated it into the poster, and I just really thought it was just an awesome visual. This is from um, Where Have You Been? So um, it's a story about a, a young girl who hooks up with a killer. Um, and, yeah, and yeah, this looks like, this does look like sketch note. Um, so she just took images and dialogue And in the back, you can see she's got even more dialogue from the story. She then was able to explain to us why she chose what she chose, why it was important. This next example is ThingLink. So they don't always have to create their own visual. They can select a visual. Um, they can select a visual. And through thing link, they can link up the items to that visual. So if you notice all of the circles and the exclamation points, all of the icons are actually linked to either or websites or text blurbs. So one of the blurbs she has here. Gatsby's experiences in New York proved that the American dream is not only a difficult goal to reach, but is truly an impossible dream to achieve during this era of American life. So they were able to select an image in response to our reading of the Gatsby and then hook up informational pieces to demonstrate or to highlight. Same link is also a great way to be able to have an e-portfolio. 
you can link up your own personal work to a chosen image to display. But in this example, they used the image and they were able to hook up different tidbits and informational bites about the Gatsby. Blackout poems. So blackout poems are something that I did a couple of years ago for the first time. And it, um, the kids liked it because they got to scribble on a sheet of paper. But, you know, so a lot of them liked the fact that they got to black out. So what I told them was, um, I told them to select words that spoke to them. All right, I told them to select words or phrases that spoke to them. They were to highlight those, and then they were to black out everything else. So this is a way that they can remix or remash all right, an ex existing text and make it something else. Um, the directions are up to you as to what you want them to do for the black. So um, the first time we did the assignment, I wanted them basically to summarize the piece. So they chose out the important items and blacked out everything else. Another time I did the assignment, I told them basically to take one piece of text and to make it something else. So they were able to take a speech. Um, this text that's on the screen was, I think it's taken from Vindication of Women. Um, so some of them took was like a call to arms um, for women to get educated, and they changed it to something else. Um, this assignment, and, and like I said on the sh on the slide, this one was the only assignment I got from the student in two weeks. The student came to class. The student listened. He paid attention. He just didn't engage enough to respond back to me and let me know that he was actually paying attention and taking in what we, what we were doing in class. With this blackout poem, he was able to pull out some of the key terms and tell me through his poem that he basically got what it was we'd been doing for the last couple of days. So a lot of them really are engaged when we because I guess they really think of it as they're destroying something, and that whole kid destructive thing excites them, I think. So that's blackout poems. I did. I had my um, English four kids do blackout poems, and we presented them to teachers for teacher appreciation week. So that was an awesome experience for the teachers and for the students. What I did was, you know, I cheated a little. bit. I took some teacher appreciation points. I wanted to make sure that they didn't struggle with coming up with um, language of their own if they didn't have it. So they were able to take those points and then focus on the pieces of text that talked to them about particular teachers. So that was like an awesome thing as well. They were able to pull out the keywords. Um, some focused on the relationship between teachers and parents, or teachers and caregivers. Um, but if everybody enjoyed it, and I'm going to continue to do it and have fun with it if you haven't tried it before. So whether you use a, a, like for instance, if your textbook, if a chapter is six or seven pages long, even if you give each kid one page of text and tell them to pull it out, pull out the units. Found poems are similar to blackout poems, but found poems allows them to find textual units and, re and manipulate them. I didn't want them to do that for this one. The blackout poem, they're going to use the text as it stands. Found poems, they can manipulate the text, but both of those are great things to do for the kids in class. 
All right, videos. Um, we are now in 2015 and 2016, and this is the selfie generation. They videotape and they post everything. So why not have them video and post responses to text? Whether it's through screencasts and how-to videos, you can have them do character narratives. They can act out um, pieces of text. They can create PSAs, public service announcements. They can create videos to just summarize text. There's so many things they can do as far as videos go. One of the first things um, I suggest, though, and I learned this the hard way, make sure you have them start. All right. If they start with a storyboard, and whether they do the storyboard in class before you want them to record, or they do it the night before as homework, it gives them the opportunity to be able to plan out each shot, each individual of their video, and it flows so much better. Um, with my kids, I've done paper slide video. I've had them do public service announcements. I've had them create so TED Talks. But I always they start with the storyboard first to make sure that they plan it out. So this is a screenshot from Photo Peach. Um, and this is a screenshot from the Animoto site. Both of those I use for the digital storytelling because it's something that's really quick and easy for the kids. Allows them to drag the pictures, put a caption underneath the pictures, select from their library some music, and in a class period, whether that class period is a 45 minute one or a 90 minute one. They have the opportunity to have created. So that's really where the storyboard really comes into play. Already have it planned out. All they need to do is to put it together. And Photo Peach and Animoto are two quick and easy websites to use. Animoto, I like, I think, um, more than I do Photo Peach just because Animoto has a lot of um, slick templates. So the video is more professional than they do with Photo Peach. But both of those are to use, and they're free. I've had kids create um, character journals, do PowerPoint slides, in a, a journal format of character, take those slides, save them as images, and then upload them to either Photo Peach or Photo. And they've created a photo slideshow in the character of one of the characters from one of our stories. That's a way of being able, if they've understood the characters' ins and outs, if they really understood the story that we were reading, they're able to express it from the point of view of the character. The assignment can be done in the science class if they take of a scientist or a social studies class. They can be President Obama. They can write out what a character journal would look like for him after current events, and you have an opportunity to see if they engaged in the text, if they really paid attention to the current events, the fact that they can really speak in the voice of the character. All right, so my slides got out of order. Sorry about that. All right, um, so that's the videos. Paper slides, paper slides. 
So the paper slide videos are the videos where the students have PowerPoint-like slides and they slide them across the table and they narrate a story. In the Live Binder, there's a link to a Drive folder and a couple of student paper slide videos. All right, let's see. The 4x4 four four or the six word memoirs. Again, you, you make the student manipulate the text. So they have to reread different sections of the text to be able to come up with a 4x4 four four response. And a 4x4 four four response means that they have to create four four word sentences. So the two examples on uh, this slide, on the bottom slide, that were done from a lesson before dying. So when to live or to die, like man or hog, world needs to change, all men are men. I generally have them do several of the four by four responses and I have them select the best one. And a lot of times what happens is <laughs> Sorry, we were disconnected. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, they're able to then synthesize the information and come up with the smaller sound bites that express their understanding of the text. We just did some four by four responses. Uh, let's say Saturday, Friday. Friday we did some four by four responses and. Um, it's difficult at first to get them to reread the text and to go back and to pull out what might be main ideas within a story or a chapter. Um, but again, it's one of those critical thinking skills where in the manipulation, in the um, composition of those 16 words, they have to revisit and they get more than they did the first time they went over it. So it's another way to get them to reread the text. And you kind of, you know, sneak that in on them. So that's four by four responses. Most of us are familiar with six word memoirs. I don't think I have any examples here. But six word memoirs are, again, you tell a story in six words. And to have them condense in 16 words or 20 words or six words, a concept within a text all right, is a skill that really does require that they, they fire on themselves and use a critical thinking skill. For the directions for the 4 by 4 the first time I did it yesterday, I didn't give them any directions other than to create four forward sentences that summarize the story of Harrison Bergeron. You can give them some explicit directions. So here's an example. You want it to be in complete sentences, use strong words. Don't use pronouns. Don't use. But I didn't give them uh, yesterday when we did it. I just wanted them to get in to play around with the idea of being able to summarize the story in four sentences. Um, a lot of them at first had. You can see a lot of question marks came up. Um, some of them pushed back. You know, it's like this is too hard. I can't do this. I can't come up with four words. But um, most of them were able to 
come up with their full sentences. And some of them really were kind of strong, too. They were kind of good. I was pleased. So, let's see. The last portfolio. And the e-portfolio is a huge piece. Everything I've talked about can go into the portfolio for them. If your kids have a collection that they want to showcase, ePortfolio would be the way to go. If, they, if it's something that on the have them take a picture and then they can upload it digitally. ePortfolios can come in different shapes, different sizes. It can be a thing link. It can be a padlet. It can be a web page. Um, there's so many different ways that you can create ePortfolios. This is an example of a template that I've used with my English 1 class. And I gave them this image of the template so that they could see how to do it. So I wanted them to have a Who I Am page. We had a poem on that page. A brief bio. We search um, projects and self discoveries. Where I come from, poem. Things I like. An average day was like a photo journal. So that's like an award page for them. All right, these are some of the things that I do well. Look what I can do. They had a project page an essay page for their personal blog. So if you're going to use ePortfolios, um, you decide a timeline. Um, you decide if you want them to have certain artifacts or if you only want them to show what they select. You know, if you want them to self-select their artifacts. So it, it's up to you as far as the requirements that you put in place for them to show off and to demonstrate. Padlet. Padlet is also a great way of being able to host an e-portfolio. Padlet allows you to upload Documents and links, videos, images. It could be a way of housing information that they want to showcase. This is a, a picture of a Padlet that I had my kids create before we did our Anglo Saxon unit. I just told them to find everything they can find online for British literature. And they just started Googling and dropping stuff on the Padlet. And it was a way for me to be able to explore the topic before we began even reading about the topic. Um, this is an example of my weekly. And uh, Classroom Live also uses Weebly. It's a really easy platform to use. And I see y'all are asking about the number of pages. And y'all have an awesome conversation going on um, in the chat room. Thank you very much. But um, I love Weebly. I have the paid version. And I love Weebly just because it's easy to drag and drop. Throw in the videos, in the links, link up different websites, throw in your calendars. All right, and the, the drag and drop is really easy, and I like all of the content that you can put on your weekly website. S'mores. I don't know how many of you are familiar with s'mores. Are a great way to have an online poster. 
that can also be used as an import. S'mores, again, has the drag and drop, so it's really easy to manipulate the items with, on the, the, uh, the page. On the s'mores, you can upload videos, audios, images, photo galleries. Um, it, it's just really endless as to what you can have on there. You can only have a certain number of free s'mores, but uh, to set it up, you know, you can have your most recent information on the top and just continue to build it from the top. But I love s'mores, just again, quick and easy to use. You know, and you can add your documents and videos and photo galleries. So e-portfolios, whether you use a s'more, that's my biggest takeaway. Um, encourage, even if it's uh, for yourself, please use an e-portfolio. Professionals, as professional educators, allow us the opportunity to collect and to show off and to share the good work that we do. So whether we're going to use a Weebly, Google Sites is a, a, a good source. So whether we use Weebly's Padlet, whether we use S'mores, um, I think we should, I encourage all of you to have, encourage our kids to have an eportfolio. as well. So uh, this is some of my contact information. Yes, I blog, I tweet, I share. Um, contact me questions or comments, I do respond, believe it or not. Any questions out there? Yes, me? I did capture some questions. I'm what blogging platform do you recommend for students? Good question, um, and that's one of those hard questions. I have high schoolers, mm -hmm. so for me, I want it to be a platform that is theirs, that's not mine, it's theirs. The first, when I started blogging, I did EduBlog, and I had control over the student's website, and I realized that that really mm -hmm. was not what I really, really wanted for them. I did not want control. I wanted them to have control. So right now, in my class, okay. so far, I've used Weebly, I've used Edublog, I've used WordPress. WordPress is um, wonky sometimes in my building. It was really slow loading. Um, but I think I'm still going to use WordPress just because I need for my kids to be able to grab their cell phone and quickly post. And for me, it seems as though the WordPress app mm -hmm. is one of the easiest way I can have my kids blog from their cell phone. A lot of the platforms allow you to email your post in, and that's a good option. I know Blogger allows you to do that. Um, Edge Blogs also allows you to do that. But I think the so select the platform on how it is your students can use it. Is it just going to be in a computer lab and at home, or are you going to need them to do it from their phone where they may need an app or they may need to email it in? So I think those are two important considerations. You know, how are the kids going to use it? And yes, I'm really sorry, everybody, about the applause. Mm -hmm. Everybody just seems to be in a blog depression. Here's, Sorry yes, about that. There are other questions. The next one is, does it take a lot of time yeah, for yeah, students to create the videos, or do they do the videoing, the video, videographing I, at school or at home? I, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. um, like I said before, the storyboard is for me the key piece. If they're out of the storyboard, then everything else um, isn't that hard. The paper slide videos, I generally uh, give them some parameters because they'll be there all day. Um, now let me back up. Mm -hmm. A lot of them make videos for play. Like mm -hmm. they're playing around with their friends on the couch making videos. But they never think about an audience audience watching it other than their friends. So when they start to do it for their classmates or for me, it's funny how they no longer like the voice sounds. They now believe that they have an accent. They, you know, they think they have a speech impediment. So mm -hmm. that's what takes the most time, them getting comfortable with having their voice be the medium that they're turning their work into. So once we get past that, they always want to redo it because their voice sounds squeaky or, you know. So um, if they've got their storyboard together, whether it's a paper slide mm -hmm. or they're acting it out, they re it really can be done a lot of times in one class period or two. All okay. Right? And, and, and that's only because they've got it planned out. So um, what you need to try to do is think about noise. So a lot of times my kids go into the hallway and um, record. So I may have one at one end of the hallway, one group at another end of the hallway. If they're doing paper slide videos, I've got a tripod set up. I've got the camera on the tripod, or we've got a kid acting like a tripod. The desks are out there. They've got their paper slides out there. They're ready to videotape. I only I tell them they only get like two or three takes, and then that's it. Because they will be there mm -hmm. all day to create what winds up being a two and a half mm -hmm. minute video. You know, because they want to get it perfect. But mm -hmm. just let them know. It's good, you know, take a couple of shots, they turn it in. Um, if they're acting out a video, a lot of times, you know, that may take a little, a whole class because you've got certain people who need to do certain things that they miss their cue. Did you? But most of it can be done oh, sorry. in one class period or two at the mm -hmm. most. All right, but I do try to give them a limit because they really will 90 minutes to mm -hmm. two minutes. It's okay. All right, I do have other questions. Let's see if I Go can ahead, Peggy. I'm sorry. get to them here. Yes, I do. You set hard Any other deadlines questions? for project okay. completion dates. Yeah, for com do I set yes. hard deadlines? Is that what you the said? Specific due date deadlines, but yeah, if yeah, I. I Okay, all right, all right, yeah, so mm -hmm. um, it, depending upon how big the project is, um, mm -hmm. there are deadlines, deadlines, and then more deadlines. If it's something like a paper slide or you know, something else, those deadlines are really easy because they, they just have a few steps that they have to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's they're reporting out on something we've read, or I may give them, if they're researching something of their own, so do the research, a couple of days to finish the storyboard, and then bam. Um, so that may take, let's say, I want them to research and present and create a paper slide video. That may take a week. And it's just two days of researching and discussing and collaborating. Another day of them planning. They may do a day of rough, you know, of we have everything together, and then bam, the last day they're recording, and they're recording, and then they're playing, you know, uh, presenting. But we did. We're part of the TED Ed Club, and as part of the TED Ed Club, they have to do researching for several weeks. So yes, there are serious guidelines, whereby you know, week two, I want to see that they've gotten this much research in. Week three, we're discussing how to present by week four. Mm -hmm. So I, I do give them check, checklists and okay. guidelines to follow as far as the big projects go. What? And 
I see Sharon's of the strategies I present, which one do I use the most? The e-portfolio. Um, I think I use the e-portfolio e more than anything because I think it's important to have the okay. students showcase their Yeah, I do have work. some others here. What's your screencasting tool of choice? Okay, oh, we've got them. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it used to be screener, um, but that no longer works for me as well. But I use uh, Jing, um, you know, a TechSmith product, and I use um, um, screencast, and both of those are easy to use, um, and it's just a matter of position the screen on your camera, click, and then, you know, proceed with the screencasting. I believe in free or really, really cheap, and um, Jing was the first product that I started using for screencast cast. So I think uh, I'm, I'll always be loyal to Ted Smith and their team. Um, but it's, it's really easy to use if you haven't tried it. Does Padlet work on iPads? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And if I had my iPad here, I try. I am. I do Padlet when we've used the computers. I haven't tried it this year with iPads. Um, I only have iPads for maybe a third of my class. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there we have a yes and yes. Thank yes. you. <laughs> See, I learned something. Thank you. Uh, I had yes. Yeah, have. Questions. You had your students present their work to other classrooms. And if we run out of time, all right, we still have questions. Have you had your students present their work to other classrooms via Skype Not or yet. Google Hangouts? <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Um, I want to be able to do that. That's like the next step. I was hoping that we'd be able to do that with um, when we mm -hmm. joined the TED Ed Club last year, but we didn't have an opportunity to really finish all of our final videos and do the big showcase and reveal. Okay. And what so do you if anyone is interested in hooking up to do that, sharing with their class, please contact me on Twitter because I do want to do that. That's, that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Go on. What things do you do on Chromebooks? Um, I'm sorry to say my district ah. does not support Chromebooks. So I personally love, love, love them. But my okay. district doesn't support them. I think those were the questions I was able to capture, and I saw a few that I captured at the very end. So thanks so much, Valerie. And we will, I think, turn this over to Peggy for the Thank upcoming you, shows. Wow, Valerie, thank you so much. Our minds are spinning, and you had so many great ideas to share. And that's why we love having teachers come to present to us, because we not only learn about the tools, but we find out exactly what works and what doesn't work in the classroom. So thank you for that. We have some other great shows coming up and want to quickly just uh, highlight them. Next week we're going to be featuring Remind.com and we've been looking forward to doing this for a long time. Um, and we have a panel of people that are going to be sharing with us during that, that session. Then we won't have a show on the Labor Day holiday weekend in the U.S. That's September 5th. Then on September 12th we have the amazing author of Ditch That Textbook, 
Matt Miller is going to be joining us. Very excited about that. September 19th, we're going to be doing a K-12 online conference preview with all of the conference organizers. That's a conference that's coming up in October, and I know that you're going to want to participate in that. So that'll be the place where you can come and hear all about it and hear how to log in and how to access all the resources. Then on September 26th, we're going to have a great presentation on e-cyber mission with Alexis Mundus. So if you haven't heard of that, be sure to check us out for that. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkadon's latest endeavor. He's gathered together all of his professional development resources in one place, including host your own webinar. You can go to this site and sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate classroom that is free as long as you make your, the session that you're holding in that room public. Teacher Entrepreneurship Week is August 24th to 27th. It's coming up. And you can see some of the presenters here, and a lot of them have presented here in Classroom 2.0 Live. You'll find familiar names in this lineup. When you exit this session and go back and review the Live Binder, in the resources area for Classroom 2.0 Live, one of the uh, tabs in there is for the featured teacher form. You could also fill out the form from the chat. And this is the direct link to nominate a featured teacher. We usually have a featured teacher each month. And you can nominate yourself as well for featured teacher. When you exit the session, the survey for Classroom 2.0 Live should open up automatically in your browser. You can also take the link in the chat box which will be dropped in there very, very soon. There it is. Peggy just did that. There's also in that resource tab in the Live Binder, you'll find the, the survey link as well. Once you complete the survey, at the very bottom, you'll find two fields, one for your name that will print out on a professional development certificate if you request one. The other is for your email address. Please use a personal email address for that rather than a school email address. The school mail clients tend to drop or block these so you don't, you don't receive them at school. The recordings are available at iTunes U in both a video collection and an audio collection. And there's an RSS feed for the show archives, in addition to going to the, the Classroom 2.0 Life website and finding the full Collaborate recordings on the website. So there are many ways to get to the archives. Special thanks again to Valerie Burton, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show, thank you so much.